Thanks very much. Um, let me put this water down. Um, all of you are complete strangers to me. I've never met any of you, so I'm a little scared. So anyway, <laughs> I'm actually from Portland, Oregon. I originally came from uh, Southern California, moved up to Portland, Oregon uh, a couple years ago. And this uh, Film Innovation Lab is dedicated really to try to help Dallas, you know, as Jeff was explaining, you know, build this community, build this new paradigm uh, for film business and startups and so on. So from an outsider's perspective, Dallas has always been, I guess in my perspective, like Dallas goes big. Like everything about Dallas is big or Texas is big. So hopefully we can go big today. And um, it's really cool. We have uh, Varvid doing the um, live streaming. He, he, I'm just kidding. Let's, let's see if who, like who, <laughs> they can get that. So anyway, <laughs> so my, <laughs> they're like sweating, like what? All right. So Film Innovation Lab, I don't know if how many people can see this um, screen here uh, with this, but do your best if you can. This is a blank screen. <laughs> uh, we're going to try to solve fi uh, financing, distribution, and community, as Jeff pointed out. And he asked me to talk about distribution. So let's talk about distribution in the form of the Elixir. Um, you're probably like, what? Elixir? Well, one way to look at Elixir is it could be your why. You probably heard of it if you uh, follow business uh, entrepreneurs. They always talk about you got to know your why. Uh, sometimes it's referred to as your purpose. Or if you're making a film, it may be your theme. Um, the bottom line, all this stuff is really kind of like at core what you're here to do. Like, why are you making films? Why do you want to make films? Why do you want to be part of the startup world? Why do you want to start a business? All that why, why, or your purpose is part of your elixir. And I'll show you why this all comes together in distribution. So the story of Buddha, Buddha said that the greatest gift to give others is your knowledge. So share it. So it's pretty simple. That's a very simple elixir to grasp, is that if you have knowledge, your job is to share it. That is your elixir. And speaking of Buddha, he is probably one of the oldest examples of the hero's journey. And the hero's journey being uh, made famous by Joseph Campbell's work, as he studied like cultural history and pared it down to almost all stories follow this um, paradigm of the hero's journey. And so this is a graphic for those of you who can see it. And this is um, this is based off of Christopher Vogler's uh, book, The Writer's Journey, which he basically took the um, all of Joseph Campbell's work about the hero's journey and he made it much easier for the layman to understand, like myself. Because I don't know if anybody had an opportunity to try to read Joseph Campbell's book, uh, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Um, it was difficult for me, because I'm not that smart. So it was a lot of information. It was like a textbook. So thank God uh, Christopher Vogler's book, The Writer's Journey, came out, because he simplified it. and made it much easier for me to understand. So for those of you who don't know The Hero's Journey, we're going to simplify it very quickly here. It starts off with a hero. And our hero starts off in the ordinary world, the known world. Uh, this might be the first act structure of the exposition, the setup. Then they have to cross this threshold, this threshold leaving the known world, going into the unknown world, where they encounter all these obstacles and conflicts and so on. Eventually, they're going to hit some kind of dark night of the soul or the abyss, where things feel all at lost. But if they can f defeat that final beast, or that final monster or whatever it might be, then they come out of it transformed. And they come out of it with an elixir, something to share back to the village. That's what the return path is. So where do we start in this little journey? We start in the known world. So once upon a time, probably the best setup for any story, because it puts you in the mindset. Um, we are part of the ordinary world, the known world. And filmmakers only knew one elixir in this known world. And it came from Hollywood. So how does Hollywood work? Well, there are six major studios, Disney, Warner Brothers, 20th Century Fox, Universal, Sony Pictures, and Paramount, Paramount Viacom. Um, so the, the real generalization, how it works, is that studios have a slate, right? They have a number of films they got to release and make during the year. 
but the executives answer to a board of directors. That's where their incentive lies. The studios decide which projects get the green light, and the film product is made, and the film product is marketed and sold to the various distribution outlets that they've had relationships with for so long, right? The goal is to make money for the stakeholders or the shareholders. That's the incentive. And they rinse and repeat. But this is a very, very scarce system. Only a few people get the chance to play in this world. So anything that's made outside of this parameter is considered the independent film world. So how does indie Hollywood work? Yes, there it is. How does indie Hollywood work? This is fun, and I get to show you my cartoons. OK, so we have a producer distributor, and they have a movie poster. And in fact, they don't even have a script. They don't have a director. They don't have a star. They have nothing more than a movie poster. But they have a long-standing relationship with a foreign film buyer. And because of this long-term relationship, this foreign film buyer looks at this poster and says, you know what? I can sell that movie for $2 million. I will buy that movie from you for $2 million if you deliver it to me at a given date. No movie has been made. It's just a relationship. So the um, producer, distributor, takes this promissory note, a promise note. There's no money exchange from the, the foreign film buyer to the distributor. It's just a promise note saying, hey, if you deliver the film by this certain amount of time, I will give you $2 million. So the distributor and producer, they will take this promissory note to the bank and get a $2 million loan. So you're thinking, oh great, you got financing now, right? You got financing, you're gonna make a $2 million film. Ah, but this is where all producers and distributors, if you're ever wondering how they make it, how they make, how they make, so, how they make it so rich, well this is how they do it. The producer takes that $2 million loan and they pocket one and a half million dollars of it and they decide that they're gonna make the film for $500,000. Now, the eager filmmakers, their fees are based on this film budget of $500,000. So your writer, your director, your cinematographer, your stars are all working under this, this confines of this $500,000 budget. Now the producer distributor, they don't feel like they're doing anything unethical because they felt like I built this long-term relationship with these foreign built buyers this is my fee. I made the deal. Without the deal happening, there would be no film. So the film gets made and delivered, and the bank is paid back their loan. Now, this process is rinsed and repeated over and over. And so you can imagine how much money a producer or a distribution company makes hand over fist. Make one and a half million dollars here, ten million dollars here, you know, and so on and so on. The same amount of work it takes to make a $2 million deal happen for a producer is the same amount of work it takes to make a $20 million deal happen for a producer. So it's more incentive for the producer or distributor to try to get as many high budgets as possible. So, but what happens when this ecosphere of the finance, foreign finance pre-sale model suddenly changes with dun 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 Netflix? So, Netflix is entering in a lot of markets internationally. So the question is, what role does the foreign film buyer have when all of a sudden there's only one outlet for the global market? If somebody could just pay eight bucks a month to see as much film TV content as possible, what role does that film, foreign film buyer have trying to place deals in their marketplace when something like t uh, Netflix comes in? So the other thing to think about is that iTunes just recently released their music subscription service, right? So you have like access to pretty much everything in the iTunes library music-wise for a $10 price point a month. Who's to say that in the next couple years, for $10 a month, you get all the music and you get all the TV shows and movies that are available on iTunes? So what we're looking at is the, you have to help me here because, just a side note, my mom's from Thailand and my dad's from New York. And when they got together, they made me. So the thing is, my mom had a very difficult time pronouncing uh, English words as I was growing up. So as any good son, I made fun of her entire life. My entire life. So as I've grown older, as an adult, I had a very difficult time speaking English words 
and it's called karma. So I was trying to pronounce the word commoditization. So any want to help me out? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so we've seen this happen in other industries, such as Walmart. Walmart has come in and made it very difficult for the independent retailer to compete with low prices and high volume. Another player in this space is Amazon. Amazon has made it very difficult for the e-commerce online business to compete because Amazon now is essentially a search engine. So if you want to have an online store, you're going to have to play in Amazon's world. So it'd be foolish just to think that this wouldn't happen to the entertainment industry with Netflix or iTunes. So where does the uber independent filmmaker go? If you are not playing in the world of Hollywood, if you are not playing in the world of indie Hollywood, which you don't have a formal um, relationship with a formal distribution company, where do you go in the world of distribution? So that takes us to the threshold. We are now leaving the known world and we are going past the threshold and we're entering in this unknown world. But there's a call to action here because it tells us that perhaps the uber independent filmmaker, the answer to distribution may be video on demand. Oh, might as well give props to Joseph Campbell here. Once we go into this unknown world, we have to expect we're going to go through some trials. And Joseph Campbell says there is no transformation without the trials. So we have to go through the lumps and bumps of trying to figure this out. Because we need this transformation in order to retrieve that elixir. So let's talk about video on demand. Um, this seems like it could be the saving grace for the Uber independent filmmaker. And most likely the Uber independent filmmaker is going to have to sell their film online. So what is VOD? And why don't we see accurate sales projection numbers? Well, the reason being is that the film studios are not obligated to share any of the numbers with anybody. They're not contractually obligated to share with each other, you know, each studio. Uh, for some reason, years ago, the theatrical box office, uh, the numbers were released to the public and it just became sort of grandfathered in. Not so with video on demand. So, how do we understand video on demand if this might be the world the Uber independent filmmaker plays in for distribution? So, here's some term terminology. Most of video on demand falls under the category of cable video on demand, or CVOD. There's also MOD and TOD for movies on demand and transactional on demand. This is if you're on a cable box and you decide to rent a movie for $4. This would be that paradigm. There's also free on demand. Now, a movie studio sometimes will have a agreement with a cable provider where a cable provider says, I will give you X amount of hundreds of thousand dollars or millions of dollars for the licensing rights for a certain amount of time to stream your movie free on our cable provider. Now, the cable provider is able to bundle this free package with other things they're going to sell. So that is free on demand. Then there's cable SVOD, and this would be cable subscription. See, I can't speak. <laughs> cable subscription video on demand. And this would be things like HBO Go. Not HBO Now, but HBO Go that is tied to a uh, cable subscription. So the accounting gets a little sticky because, you know, royalties have to get paid out to HBO and royalties have to be paid out to the cable companies. Then there's subscription video demand as you probably know it as Netflix. There's also IVOD or AVOD. And this is internet video on demand or ad supported video on demand. And this is like Hulu or Crackle. So majority of the numbers you might see reported in the press about video on demand uh, sales numbers, more than half of it is coming from this space. And the thing is, is that most Uber independent filmmakers will not be working in this space because you still need in a formal relationship with a distributor and a cable company. So that leaves us with digital downloads or electronic sell through which is called EST. This is sort of the world of the Uber independent filmmaker. There's also OTT for over the top, meaning this is like devices outside of the cable box. This is Apple TV, this is Roku, the Roku box, uh, Amazon Fire, and so on. So there are some VOD platforms that we know. There's iTunes, of course. There is Amazon Instant Video. 
and there's Google Play, and there's Netflix. If you want to get on any one of these platforms right now, you can. You just use an aggregator. And an aggregator is different than a distributor. So a relationship between a filmmaker and a distributor would be something like this. If you are a filmmaker that you made your film for $250,000 and you haven't had, you don't have a formal relationship with a distributor, but you're hoping to get your film sold, a distributor may offer you $5,000 cash advance and take majority of the licensing control of your film to be able to sell your film to their foreign buyers. You know that whole system I just showed you? The thing is that a distributor has a film catalog and they will look at your film and say, maybe I can sell this amongst my catalog. What, what a distributor does with their film catalog is sort of like a diversified mutual fund account, right? <laughs> maybe one thing will hit. Not every film is going to hit, but one of them is going to hit. And maybe a handful hit. And those handful of films that hit, that make the distributor uh, money, well, that will cover all the expenses for all the other films that didn't make any sales. So this is that paradigm. If you want to work with an aggregator, this is the aggregator, they provide a technical quality assurance service. All they do is take your file as a filmmaker and make sure that it's technically in the same parameters that the, each platform wants it. iTunes wants it a certain way, Amazon wants it a certain way, Google Play, so on. That's it. So the filmmaker pays a flat fee, anywhere from $800 to $2,500 to get your film onto these platforms. Now some aggregators pose themselves as distributors. Some aggregators will even say, I will take a 50-50 split. But some, there's so many more aggregators coming up that um, you can just use them as a service. And uh, the other thing too is there's, there's actually a lot of affiliates out there that pose themselves as aggregators. And all they're doing is taking you, filmmaker, as a lead and they turn it over to an actual proved ag aggregator. So this type of stuff happens. So right now, if you want to use distribution right away to get a Netflix, Amazon, iTunes, you can do it right now with aggregators. Just pay a flat fee. But guess what? Nobody's going to market and sell your film. You still have to do that yourself. So there are direct digital platforms. If you want to bypass the aggregation companies altogether, you can use Vimeo on demand. You can use VHX. You can use Distrify. There's Indie Rain. All this stuff gives you worldwide access to an audience with your film but you still have to do the marketing and selling of your film. So here's some numbers we can get into with electronic sell-through, if this is the world of the Uber independent filmmaker. Um, it's all based off transactional uh, projections and conversion rates. The average inbound marketing rate is 1% to 3%. So if we take this average inbound marketing rate and say you have some trailer views, say you have 1,000 trailer views, with the average inbound marketing rate of 1% to 3%, you would probably garner about 10 to 30 transactions. So 10 to 30 transactions times the $10 price point, you might be earning $100 to $300. So another way to look at it is if you have a $25,000 film budget, $25,000 divided by $4 rental price online, right? Somebody's going to you know, buy your film or rent it online. You would uh, that would garner about a little over 6,000 transactions. Now the 1 to 3% average inbound marketing rate would mean that your trailers, your view, how many trailer views you would need is anywhere over 600,000 to 1.8 million trailer views just to make that conversion work, just to get $25,000 back, you know, from your film's budget. So the experts tell us that we need to do hybrid distribution. This involves theatrical events, cable video on demand, TV deals, foreign distribution, and of course, EST. The problem is all those other hybrid distributions still require a relationship with a formal distribution company. So meanwhile, what's going on over the book publishing industry? Well, the book publishers still have relationships with retailers. However, advances for authors have diminished. They re and publishers actually require authors to have an audience already. And they also require the author to do the marketing. A publisher publishes, a writer writes, but no one sells. And authors do not make money selling books anymore. Now over the music industry, well, the 
music uh, publisher industry. They have relationships with promoters and radio stations still, but advances have diminished. They still require musicians to have an audience to begin with. They require musicians to do their own marketing. And musicians do not make money selling you know, their music. That's not what they do anymore. Um, so, what business is Hollywood really in? Hollywood is in the business of license exploitation. Not making films, not making TV shows, they're making, their whole business is rolled around who controls the IP license, license exploitation. And George Lucas is probably the biggest poster boy of this. And he even says all the money is in the action figures. And for those of you who don't know the story of George Lucas from the Star Wars, is that when he made his first film, well, his first film, when he made Star Wars, 20th Century Fox retained the licensing rights to the film, but he, Lucas was able to retain all the merchandise and ancillary rights to his product. He built an empire off action figures. Hollywood never made that mistake again, which is why you see Hollywood like, we bought the Transformers license, and we're gonna make a movie. Doesn't matter if it's good or not, we're gonna make a movie because we're gonna sell a lot of toys. You can exploit the license in books, graphic novels, TV shows, music, whatever it can be. It's license exploitation. So, what business are we in? If Hollywood is in the business of license exploitation, then why can't we, as uber independent filmmakers, do the same thing? How can we not exploit our own licenses? And you do this by viewing your film as something different. You view your film and you use your film as an advertisement. Not a film product, but an advertisement. So, another way to look at it is volume versus value. Hollywood plays the volume game. They gotta sell a lot of transactions. They gotta make a lot of, you know, turnover to make up for this large budgets that they put out there. Well, the Uber independent filmmaker, they can play the value game. They can go opposite. Anybody remember Seinfeld? You can be George Costanza and you go opposite. So, one way to look at it is like Starbucks coffee, right? It's like four bucks a coffee. The only difference is the Starbucks has a addictive, addictive, a addictive ingredient. My mom's looking at me going, oh, 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 you're such a bad boy. All right, um, so addictive, an addictive ingredient in Starbucks product at $4 price point. They sell a lot of coffees, that's a lot of volume. Well, the Uber independent filmmakers selling their film online for a $4 rental price we can't match that volume. It's very, very difficult. So, again, if you look at that scenario I showed you, how much, how many trailer views you would need to get a make back your twenty-five thousand dollars at this price point. So, where does this leave us in the hero's journey? Ah, oh, we're at the abyss. Thank you. All is lost. Things suck. You can't be. We thought video on demand was our saving grace, and it's not. At least that's what we're told. But if we slay this beast, what happens? We retrieve the elixir. So let's see what this elixir is. Let's imagine we take this $4 price point and we turn it into $100. This comes from Kevin Kelly's uh, 1,000 True Fans blog many, many years ago. Kevin Kelly was the co-founder or founding editor of Wired Magazine. And the concept is simple enough, he said that he hypothesized that every independent artist, musician, author, and video maker, if they can garner 1,000 true fans, and those 1,000 true fans gave that artist $100 every year, they can make $100,000. A very nice, middle class, comfortable living. 1,000 true fans can be translated into community, which is what we're going to discuss later today. So, if your film is an advertisement, and you can possibly see something like this happen. Many of you have probably gone to websites, like tech websites, and they have like, you can get our basic package, or elite package, and our premier package, and it's like this price tiered section. Imagine if your film was like for $10. And this is an advertisement for something bigger. And the bigger thing is the $100 price point, maybe it's modules, maybe it's like a, uh, a training series that expands or exploits the license that your film has advertised. And then if you want to use 
anchor price, a high price anchor price, like a 999, 999, 997, I should probably just say $1,000 for God's sakes. $1,000. That basically offsets, because you know, maybe one or two percent will actually buy your thousand dollar product. It's really just to drive people back to the middle product that says, look, this is the best deal at ninety-seven dollars. So with this new our hero's journey diagram, we have this newfound elixir. And we're bringing it back to the village and bringing it back to the masses. So what is our elixir? Well, the new distribution model, perhaps. This is just a suggestion, that's all. We're in the business of license exploitation, just like Hollywood is. Your film is an advertisement. If you stop looking at your film as so precious as the precious product that you put so much money into, perhaps if you look at it as an advertisement that you're selling something you know, at a larger, higher price point, then perhaps you can be successful in the new distribution model. And you sell on value and not volume. Don't play the volume game if you don't have all these things in place. Play the value game. Less transactions, but higher quality value, and that's how you serve your community. And distribution is really not the problem anymore. Marketing, right? And one way we can solve this marketing problem is by embracing our elixir. And our elixir, what does it do? Our elixir serves your audience. So how do you serve? Well, first you gotta identify your audience. Then you gotta listen to your audience, because they'll tell you what they need and whether or not your elixir matches what their needs are. And you wanna ask, like, how can your elixir serve your audience? And you advertise that value. So you're probably wondering, does this, any of this stuff work? Well, at Film Trooper, I run a podcast and some other various things with blogs and Google Hangout sessions where I talk to filmmakers about this type of stuff as we try to break down the barrier of uh, film entrepreneurship and marketing. Well, I had this guest on, this documentary filmmaker, and his case study is that he made a documentary film, he took it to um, film festivals and got no distribution deal. And he had no audience afterwards, he had nothing. He, even had, he didn't have an email list, nothing. But through trial and error, he eventually found his true fans. He found his real audience. Once he found his real audience, which weren't other filmmakers, that's probably a little caveat there. Don't try to market your film to other filmmakers. It's too broad. You need to narrow it down to what your elixir means to that very specific person. So they double down on their true fans. And remember that we're in the business of license exploitation? Well, they offered a licensing deal to this true fans, and they marked up the price of that licensing deal. These guys made $1.3 million. Since they had such a small crew, they were able to keep over 50% of that. The film is called Age of Champions. It's about a group of senior citizens competing in the Senior Olympics. And you can listen to the full podcast interview over at filmtrooper.com forward slash 77 with documentary filmmaker Christopher Rufo. Now, we're gonna get into like workshop or thing, you know, discussions. Um, keep this stuff in mind. Identify your theme of your movie. This could be your elixir. Your theme could also be your marketing message. For instance, if your theme is Love Conquers All, instead of trying to market your film because you have a B-rated star in your film or something like that, how about marketing that Love Conquers All? Maybe that is an emotional connection people have that could springboard your film. Now, you wanna ask, like, does your theme reveal any value? Because what you're trying to do is, what high value product can be offered in service to this audience? Now here's something crazy. We have filmmakers here, and we have tech startup people here, you know, with this entrepreneurial mindset. The idea here is Buddha said, share your elixir, share your knowledge. Go ahead, once you kind of have an idea of what your elixir might be, or your purpose, or your why, share it with others, because it'd be really cool to see a filmmaker have a shared elixir with like somebody who's in the tech startup world. And you know the whole point of like, maybe a film is an advertisement for something more valuable? What if a tech startup person here has a product that is of a high value you know, price? And they connect with a filmmaker that shares the same elixir, the same value, the same purpose. Now that could be something worth gold here. You know, melding of the minds. 
I don't know who said this, but it's pretty cool. Knowing the why will lead to the how. So once you know what your purpose is, your elixir is, your why is, that will lead you down the path like, well, how do we share this elixir to our audience and how do we serve them? So if you've been following this, trying to take notes, I should have told you. You could just go to filmtrooper.com forward slash innovation and you could download this entire slide presentation I just showed you, plus more, because I got some other gifts for you there. And oh, those watching on the live stream, the, uh, just kidding, I'm screwing <laughs> The live stream, you can also go to filmtrooper.com forward slash innovation. You'll get a free video on demand and digital download report if you want to see some sales projection numbers. You also get a worksheet of how to find your theme or your elixir. And lastly, you know, there's some other bonus there. I don't forget. But anyway, that's it. That's all my time, I think. I don't know if I ran over, but hopefully that'll help, you know, spur the conversation in the workshop. Okay, guys, we're ready for our first brainstorming session. We're talking about distribution and uh, let your mind flow. And let's think about how we can improve the system or in different ways, but let's do something else. Let's, uh, uh, since I'm learning class of a blue ocean, let's create some uh, new companies, some new models to where it makes the competition irrelevant. And uh, so we have some team leaders that I've chosen. So if you guys, the team leaders, could stand up right now. We got Derek back there. We got Hutch. We got Marcus. We got David. I think that should cover us. If not, oh, we got Raj. All right. Raj. All right. So if you guys can, we'll do it informally, grab a team, and we'll be going for 25 minutes and then take a break. And there we go. So go for it. <laughs> 